So number of attendees is, is, is keep growing actually. <coughs> Okay, so I suggest I will start now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Excellencies, uh, Ministers, Ambassadors, Executive Director of UN Women, Mr. Fremont, President of the University of Ottawa, colleagues and friends of Canada in Finland and the University of Ottawa, greeting from the city of Ottawa. My name is Adel Zaim. I'm the University of Ottawa Associate Vice President International. I would like to start this event by a sincere thank you to our panelists and to our partners, especially the ambassadors and the, ambas the ambassador of Finland and the embassies team of Finland in Ottawa. Also to Global Affairs Canada, UN women, researchers and the specialists on this very important human development challenge, which is the women and girls rights. We are here today to learn from our two ministers Minister of uh, International Development of Canada and International Development and Cooperation of Finland about the role of governments as well as from practitioners, policymakers, and researchers about how to advance those rights, especially uh, through innovation and technologies in this pandemic uh, situation. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jacques Fremont, uh, President of our university, for his welcoming remarks. Let me say a few words about Mr. Fremont. Jack Fremont was appointed president and vice chancellor of the University of Ottawa in 2016, and his mandate was renewed in 2021. Prior to this, he was the chair of Quebec's Human Rights and Youth Rights Commission and director of the International Higher Education Support Program at Open Society Foundations. He also served at the University of Montreal in various roles, including provost and vice, vice rector academic affairs and Dean and the Professor at the Faculty of Law. Mr. Fremont has advised international organization on issues of human rights, good governance and democracy. And he directed several important international cooperation projects in the field of human rights and judicial training. Mr. Fremont, the floor is yours, please. Merci beaucoup, uh, Adèle. Uh, alors, uh, Your Excellency, Minister Erickson, Your Excellency, Minister Skinnery, and Honorable uh, Minister Gold, uh, Mrs. Fonsili, Malambo, and Nkuka, uh, and all colleagues joining us uh, today. Uh, bienvenue, bienvenue à cette activité organisée par l'Université d'Ottawa. We are going to discuss today a vitally important topic concerning the use of technology to advance the economic empowerment of women and girls in a post-pandemic environment. And God knows women and girls have suffered, especially during that pandemic. So it is even more important. I wish to thank in particular our esteemed guests for their participation at this event, co-organized by the University of Ottawa, the Embassy of Finland and Global Affairs Canada. Whenever we gather for an important event like this, uh, even online, it is our custom to begin by offering an indigenous affirmation in support of reconciliation. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land where the University of Ottawa is located. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. The Obstacles preventing women from achieving economic equality are in one sense universal, as they are everywhere rooted in patriarchic <laughs> attitudes and systems. And yet these obstacles are also localized, localized and culturally specific with each country and community facing its own distinct, distinct challenges and on its own trajectory towards equality. In this basically unequal context, it is essential that uh, in countries where women have achieved, I would say some greater economic equality like Canada and Finland, for instance, 
that we commit to playing a leadership role in supporting opportunities for the advancement of women around the world. At the University of Ottawa, we welcome year after year students from more than 150 countries from around the world. And we are always proud to welcome young women from dozens of countries as both undergraduates and graduates programs, students in our STEM uh, programs, just as we are very proud of our many women faculty members doing advanced research in photonics, wireless technologies, computer network, AI, big data, medical imaging, and entrepreneurship among other areas. We also have a women's startup network that provides leadership training and mentorship for young women aspiring to be successful engineering or computer science entrepreneurs. In addition, at the University of Ottawa, we also conduct vital research on the topic of women and entrepreneurship, such as that which has been undertaken for many years by Professor Barbara Orser, who is with us uh, today, uh, and whose work on entrepreneurial feminism, small and medium enterprise growth, and public policy has had an impact far and wide. Good to see you, Barbara, today. Through these efforts and many others, the University of Ottawa impact the socioeconomic development of women far and wide, helping to nurture and train the next generation of women leaders in science and technology. And yet, I know that we have much more to do and much to learn from others around the world who are playing leadership roles in promoting women's economic advancement. That is why we are here today, to listen and learn. So I will conclude by offering my sincere thanks for this opportunity to speak with you. And I will now turn my attention to listening and learning. Thank you again for your presence uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur Fremont. Uh, it's my honor now to introduce His Excellency Roy Eriksson, uh, the Ambassador of Finland in Canada since uh, 2019. Mr. Frex, uh, Eriksson uh, served as the Ambassador of Finland to Mexico, as well as being the concurrent Ambassador of Finland to Central America. Ambassador Eriksson started his career in the Ministry of Foreign Affair, for Foreign Affairs of Finland in 1990. He has served in different departments of the ministry, the latest being the Department of Americas, uh, the Department for Americas in Asia, where he worked as a director for Latin America and the Caribbean. Further to Mexico, he has served in Turkey, Germany, and the Finnish permanent mission to the European Union in Brussels. This is the second time he represent his country in Canada. Mr. Erickson, the floor is yours. Thank you for your kind inter introduction. It is my pleasure to give my opening remarks to this topical webinar. We were discussing already late last year in the embassy how the pandemic is affecting women disproportionately all over the world. You know, Finland has promoted gender equality for decades and one of our focus areas in development aid has been the education of girls and women. At the embassy, we came up with the idea to organize an event where the focus would be on the economic empowerment of women in the wake of the pandemic and how technology and innovation can contribute to this. We mulled over the theme and contacted various people and organizations to find out what could be done. I'm very happy that the University of Ottawa and Global Affairs of Canada agreed to co-host this webinar. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the people from the university, Global Affairs, including the Embassy of Canada in Helsinki, as well as my colleagues at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland for helping to realize our idea. I'm looking forward to hearing the in inputs of our distinguished uh, panelists, the Honorable Karina Gold, His Excellency Ville Skinnari, Executive Director Fumzile Malabo Nkuka, Mrs. Uh, Milia Köpsi, and Professor Barbara Oser. I'm also happy that some students will give their input to the discussion. The topic of this webinar is the economic empowerment of women. For Finland, 
who was the first country in the world to give full political rights to women in 1906. It is important to recognize the value of everyone. Okay, a, a society that acknowledges the potential of women will have better chances for development. It is also in this vein, Finland is seeking a seat at the UN Human Rights Council 2022-2024. As a member, Finland could promote gender equality also through this important institution. Today, we will hear how Canada is taking into account the empowerment of women in her feminist foreign policy. We will hear how technology and innovation can enhance the situation of women. Another venue for empowerment of women is entrepreneurship, but this needs inputs in education. How to get girls and women interested in technology and running their own businesses. UN Women has a mandate to promote gender equality, and I'm expecting to hear their ideas for action in the wake of the pandemic. But without further ado, I will give the floor to the Master of Summer Ceremony. I'm sure we will have an interesting discussion. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Thank you, Your Excellency. It's my pleasure now to uh, give the floor to my colleague, Martin Legacy, uh, who will be moderating the panel. Uh, Martin Legacy is the University uh, Associate Vice President for Research, Promotion and Development since August 2018. She is a professor in the Department of Communication and is affiliated with the School of Psychology. Professor Legacy has tremendous experience in the university administration and an extensive expertise in journalism. She worked at Radio Canada for more than 10 years. Her research interests cover the psychological aspect of aging, particularly as they relate to discrimination based on age. Martine, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, Adèle. Uh, bonjour à toutes, bonjour à tous. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon to some of you. Excellency Erickson, President Fremont, distinguished panelists, c'est vraiment un honneur pour moi de vous accueillir et de présider ce panel de discussion aujourd'hui. Uh, uh, before anything, uh, I would like to encourage attendees to already prepare their questions using the chat or the Q&A function. We will have about 10 minutes at the end of this webinar to take your questions. As stated before, the coronavirus uh, pandemic is disproportionately hitting women uh, and women's rights are facing increasing challenges in the wake of the pandemic. UN Women's Report entitled From Insights to Action, Gender Equality in the Wake of the Pandemic shows that women bear a burden in care work and are more likely to leave the workforce. Unpaid care work is an issue requiring our attention. The economic empowerment of women is essential for sustainable recovery. Women should be equally involved in harnessing the potential of technology and innovation. Supporting women entrepreneurs as well as the education of girls are key factors in this. As stated before, Finland and Canada are long-standing advocates of human rights, including women's rights that are addressed in the Generation Equality Forum. This webinar aims to highlight key challenges and identify ways forward in global collaboration. The University of Ottawa jointly with the Embassy of Finland and Global Affairs Canada developed this webinar to discuss these important issues and to learn about what the governments, the academia and the civil society are doing to better empower women and girls in the world. Our first speaker is the Honorable Karina Gould, Canada's Minister of International Development. The Honorable Karina Gould was first elected as a member of parliament for Burlington in 2015. A graduate of McGill University and the University of Oxford, Minister Gould is passionate about public service and international development. Before her election as the member of parliament for Burlington, she worked as a trade and investment specialist for the Mexican Trade Commission in Toronto a consultant for the Migration and Development Program at the Organization of American States in, in Washington, D.C., and has spent a year develop, volunteering at an orphanage in Mexico. 
Minister Good will discuss how Canada's feminist international assistance policy supports the needs of women and girls in the context of the pandemic, and especially what is Canada is doing to ensure that recent gains for women's economic empowerment are preserved. Minister Gould. Thank you for the chance to join you today. This is a crucial topic. When we talk about advancing rights for women and girls, what does that actually mean? It's not about ignoring men and boys. It is about putting women and girls in the center of our solutions. As Malala Yousafzai says, we cannot all succeed when half of us are held back. But when you look around the world and here at home in Canada, there are far too many examples of women being held back. In fact, the unequal distribution of unpaid care responsibilities is one of the key barriers to women's economic empowerment. We don't have to look far for examples. According to international labor organization data, women perform on average 3.2 times more unpaid care work than men. This infuriating statistic limits women's participation in education and training, employment and entrepreneurship, and political and civic activities. COVID-19 has reminded us all of the stark inequalities that pervade our societies. Although this pandemic has affected each and every one of us, from online school to video conferencing to vaccination rollouts, we know that the impacts of COVID-19 are not distributed equally. Around the world, we see the pandemic exposing vulnerabilities in our societies, in our countries, and in our economies. These vulnerabilities threaten to roll back decades of progress in advancing gender equality. Women are on the front lines of the service industry, retail, hospitality, tourism, and entertainment sectors. All of these industries have been hit hard by closures and social distancing. Then we add school and childcare closures and family illness. The effect is that employment rates have plummeted for women. Globally, the employment loss for women stands at 5% in 2020 versus 3.9% for men. Unpaid care work and the disproportionate portion of care shouldered by women and girls is a root cause of global inequality. That's why now, and as we walk the path to recovery, Canada's feminist international assistance policy is about addressing the main barriers to women's economic empowerment. We partner with civil society, women's rights organizations, and grassroots organizations to promote women's well being and participation in economic life. We also work with other partner governments to find ways that laws, policies, and programs can be improved to support women and girls. I mentioned video conferencing earlier. We've all seen how our society's dependence on technology has increased significantly as a result of COVID-19. This virtual world is embedded in the real world. And so we see gender inequalities in terms of access to internet, technology, or even mobile phones. Addressing the digital gap and the inequalities that characterize it is more important than ever. I will give you an example. In South Africa, after the pandemic hit, small market farmers called petty farmers were sidelined. They used to sell their crops by the side of the road and eked out a living day to day. But when COVID hit, everyone went online. We saw it here in Canada with Amazon parcels piling up on everyone's doorsteps. But these women had no background in digital commerce. So for them, their customers virtually disappeared overnight. Through partnering with our Women's Voice and Leadership Program, these women got training and took their business online. They took their business to where everyone else was. That is women finding the power switch. That is empowerment. That is harnessing technology and innovation. Innovation means making things better. So innovation and development is a process, a mindset to enable locally driven solutions for better results and greater impact. In Gaza, we partnered with a local organization, the Mon Development Center, to improve access to safe, affordable water and good hygiene. Solar panel installation allowed women and girls to save on average two and a half hours per day per
processing milk and about 90% of the physical effort and time used for water fetching and heating. It reduces drudgery in the time spent on unpaid care tasks. These are examples of the power of innovation and the use of technology in making life better for everyone. And who understands the problem best? The women and girls affected by it. Women's rights organizations and grassroots organizations are critical actors in the frontline response. They advocate for gender equality at the center of COVID-19 response and recovery plans. They have faced hurdles and found solutions. They have seen problems and fixed them. They have endured sacrifice and found creativity. They are holding their governments to account, ensuring the rights of women and girls are respected, but they remain underfinanced. Globally, only 0.5% of international assistance earmarked for gender equality is going to women's rights organizations, according to the OECD. This needs to change. Canada, in partnership with the Ford Foundation, has launched a global alliance to leverage more and better funding for feminist movements and organizations. And while we are on the topic, I'd like to congratulate my Finnish colleagues for their leadership in helping to drive ahead UN Women's Generation Equality Forum, particularly through their co-leadership of the Technology and Innovation Action Coalition. On Canada's part, through the Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership, we intend to bring renewed strength, stability, and institutional support for women's organizations and movements. We must stand together and find innovative ways to partner and promote hope. Then as the pandemic recedes, we will harness the power behind the waves of innovation to really advance the rights of women and girls. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Minister Gull, for these uh, thoughtful uh, remarks. We will have the opportunity to come back to, to them later on uh, towards the end of the webinar. It is my pleasure now to invite uh, His Excellency Ville Skinneri, Minister of Development Cooperation and Foreign Trade, to give his remarks. Mr. Ville Skinneri has been a member of the Finnish Parliament since 2015 and Minister of Development Cooperation and Foreign Trade since 2019. He has been a member of the Constitutional Committee, the Finance Committee and the Committee on Transport and Communication. He has also been a member of the Finnish delegation to the Nordic Council. Mr. Skinneri has served as vice chairman of the Social Democratic Party since 2017 and a member of the Lati City Council since 2012. He has studied at the University of Wolverhampton and Brunel University in London. Minister Skinneri, what are Finland's priorities in the Generation Equality Action Coalition on Technology and Innovations for Gender Equality? And precisely how can technology and innovation help advance the economic empowerment of women and girls in their recovery from the pandemic and after the pandemic, of course? And Madame and Monsieur, ladies and gentlemen, very pleased to meet you today. Regards from Helsinki and regards from Finland and good morning to everybody in, in North America and Canada. Um, your question goes directly to the point, and if, if you don't mind, I open up that a little. But of course, first of all, I want to say hello to my Canadian friends. And I was supposed to say something about the NHL playoffs, but, but since it's such a sensitive issue, I leave that for, for, for later purposes. But first of all, I want to thank the University of Ottawa and my Canadian colleague, Minister Karina Cole, for your cooperation in organizing this interesting event. I really feel privileged uh, to be part of this excellent team, this excellent panel, and I really look forward to, to our discussion today. Um, and as said, it's, it's so important to speak about this important topic. And it's also my pleasure as a Minister of, of Development. Gender equality and technology and innovation are foreign policy priorities for Finland. 
So this is something I would like to underline, first of all. Finland is uh, one of the leaders of the multi-stakeholder generation equality action coalition on technology and innovation for gender equality. The five year long work will kick off this summer in the Gen Generation Equality Forum in Paris. The aim is to create concrete action to advance gender equality and bridge the gender digital divide. I wish to highlight five priorities that are at the very center of our action coalition. These actions will help advance the economic empowerment of women and girls in the recovery after pandemic and of course for future purposes. In this work, we, we must also address uh, the different barriers. Let me start by just giving you a, well, some figures about the situation. According to the research data, global GDP would increase by 26% if women had the same economic opportunities as men, meaning access to education, access to employment. So this is something that I really want to come up with. First of all, we want to increase the number of girls and women studying science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Secondly, in order to build a more equal basis for our future societies and economies, we must start systematically increase women's participation and leadership in digital economies. Thirdly, all women and girls should have equal digital access and competencies. Both are increasingly important for seeking and generating employment opportunities worldwide. Digital skills are also more required in accessing education. Different services have also moved online. Fourthly, we must foster women's representation in innovation ecosystems and innovation processes. It's important to develop gender sensitive and gender transformative technology and innovations. We must strengthen our support to women-led entrepreneurship. We must also ensure that digital policies advance gender equality. And finally, we must elim eliminate gender-based violence online. To ensure that our actions benefit everyone, diversity of women and girls must be taken into the account. We must pay special attention to women and girls in vulnerable situations, such as women and girls with disabilities. These priorities are also reflected in our candidacy for the UN uh, Human Rights Council for the 2022 and 2024 term as a continuation of our long-term commitment to the promotion, protection and advancement of human rights for all. Finland has uh, uh, pledged uh, to respect, protect and fulfill the rights of women and girls and to advance digital development and new technologies for the benefit of all. COVID-19 has really shown uh, that access to digital technologies is critical um, in a time of crisis, as well as for the recovery. For example, technology is providing ways for women-owned owned enterprises to continue their business where physical access to marketplaces is no longer possible. Also, digital means are becoming increasingly important for seeking and generating employment opportunities. Online career and recruit, recruitment platforms 
such as the Finnish um, developed FUSU, are tackling the challenges of youth unemployment in Africa. Even before pandemic, women lagged behind men in the use of digital technologies, especially in low and middle income countries. The lack of connectivity and digital skills of women and girls hindered them from benefiting from COVID recovery measures. We hope that many of you um, uh, could join us in this work to make tech equal for everybody. Uh, these truly are the questions of today and um, game changers of the futures, as the pandemic has shown us. But ladies and gentlemen, I, I do apologize. I, I have to leave a bit early and, and the ambassador, uh, Roy Erickson, will take over uh, 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 after me. But thank you so much. And I really appreciate your work. And hopefully we can physically meet you. Merci beaucoup. Many thanks, uh, Minister Skinari, for these uh, certainly inspiring and uh, once again thoughtful remarks. Um, it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Mrs. Fumzile Mlambo Engoka, Executive Director, UN Women. Mrs. Fumzile Mlambo Engoka is United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. She was sworn into office on August 19th, 2013 and brings a wealth of experience and expertise to this position, having devoted her career to issues of human rights, equality, and social justice. Mrs. Mlambo Ngoka has worked in government and civil society and with the private sector and was actively involved in the struggle to end apartheid in her home country of South Africa. Mrs. Fumzile Mlambo how has this global pandemic affected especially women? We have started hearing about it. Uh, women who have had the largest burden to bear and have suffered economically. What solution, for example, does the UN envisage to recover? Uh, and how can, once again, technology and innovation assist in empowering women in this regard? Thank you very much, um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Women have been affected by this uh, pandemic disproportionately. They have lost jobs. Two thirds of the jobs that were lost during the pandemic were lost by women. This is because uh, many of the jobs that were lost were lost in the service sector, hospitality and tourism, where there is a lot of women who, who work there. And many of those women who are working in these areas do not have enforceable contracts. They are also not covered by labor laws. Women were also uh, affected by violence. Uh, Gender-based violence increased, especially at the height of lockdowns. Women were also uh, affected, that is girls, uh, in education because uh, schools closed more than, more than a, a, a I mean, the, the large number of children who did not go to school, when they reopened, girls did not come back uh, to school. This was because of early pregnancy. Uh, it was also because of early and forced child marriage. Women were also affected by the burden of care. Not only did they provide us with the support that we needed in hospitals, because uh, a large number of health workers are women, women, but are also caregivers. So even people who were at home, old people were also being looked after by women. Children also were looked after by women. So one thing we can say about this pandemic is that it was much harder for those with the least possibility to protect themselves. How have women uh, managed to help uh, themselves? In the area of uh, ending violence against women, it has been uh, possible to use innovation and technology to support women women in Spain, women in Argentina, 
and women in Fiji were able to use different applications to give a, a notice to people elsewhere who could assist them and save them uh, and provide services that are needed when women are affected by violence. Innovation and technology is also very important for women because many of the women who did not go back to work uh, are likely never to go back to work anyway, anyway, because uh, a lot of the jobs of the future will need a form of technology. We are therefore calling for the training of women as much as possible so as to make them uh, skilled and uh, to enable the women to take back their jobs and to transform into the new jobs that come with uh, technology. Children who are still school going need to have access to technology. In many of the schools that uh, uh, the girls and boys go to, there isn't adequate infrastructure. Uh, we therefore calling for the infrastructure to be made available in order to make sure that uh, girls and boys will be able to attend uh, uh, schools. We also are calling for the training of teachers so that uh, teachers are able to use infrastructure uh, uh, to teach. It is clear that the future uh, of work is definitely tech needing technology and those who do not have adequate means uh, to use technology will be left behind. It therefore becomes important to make sure that uh, uh, training and access to technology becomes something that uh, is available to both men and women, girls and boys. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mrs. Fumzi Limnambo Ngoka. And uh, there, there was many, many inspiring uh, statements in your remarks. And once again, I'd like to encourage attendees of the webinar today to start entering their questions in the either using the Q&A or the chat function. We have about 10 minutes at the end of the seminar, uh, webinar, I should say, to take uh, the questions. And I'm sure there's going to be uh, many, many questions um, as we have been hearing uh, very thoughtful uh, and inspiring uh, remarks. Uh, C'est maintenant mon plaisir d'inviter Miss Milia Kopsi, coordinator of Women Code, Finnish uh, influencer and face of the hashtag Mimit Coda program that I, I discovered, I must say. Uh, Milia Kopsi is a name synonymous with equality for being an active voice for thousands of adult women who have uh, seldom or never received support or encouragement for their studies or work in technology. The Mimit Kuda, I hope I pronounced this well, or Women Code program has received several um, accolades, including the EU Equality Prize and Diversity Leader of the Year 2020 series in the Nordic Women in Tech competition. Milia, could you please share your perspectives on, on the best ways to support women and girls towards careers in technology and what concrete efforts could be made globally to support such development? Thank you. Excellencies, the Equest, everyone here, good morning and good afternoon. Um, I would like to start telling a story about me. In my teen years, we had a computer at home and I was really interested in it, even though all the marketing and computer related media were targeted on boys and young men. And then my school counselor said that I should give my place in IT class for a boy because I'm a girl and girls should take typing classes instead. And yes, of course. So I chose typing classes and later on I have worked in other fields than IT until now. And still, my heart aches. 30 years later, I hear these stories about the parents, study counselors, career instructors, and teachers who tell young women that tech is only for the boys, that it is for men. 
And we have multiple studies and we have heard people's stories like mine about why women have been left out of the tech field. These women through decades and still lacked support, possibilities and peer examples. We have outdated gender stereotypes and roles. We know what prevents these women from entering tech studies and from pursuing a career change. And there, there we also pass a solution to this problem. We need to move away from the gender coder and tech stereotypes because all of those hold women back. I met a dad who told me that his three years old girl will never be a software developer because she is a girly girl and loves princess stuff. And this girl, she was just three years old and her father already closed so many doors and opportunities with his own assumptions. And I'm pretty sure this girl is not going to be a princess either, except maybe in software businesses because you can create wonderful worlds for little and bigger princesses. Our own society perpetuates stereotypes that are harmful to all, imprisoning people with individual strengths falling short because of, because of these old fashioned notions. But hear me out, software does not rule out anything. Quite the opposite, it creates opportunities to show your skills, your values, your interests and strengths, regardless of gender. A girl can be a princess as well as a software developer. We need to just adjust how we talk about the tech. Tech is more than that just tech. We need to talk about we need to talk more about how tech enables everything in our private and in our work life. We need to educate parents, teachers, counselors, so they know exactly what possibilities tech industry offers nowadays. Because every company is now a software company and every other industry needs software. As a result, these possibilities, there are possibilities to make an impact and they are endless. We all know these applications like Tinder and TikTok and all these other apps for work and fun like this Zoom we are using. But software also creates solutions for the bigger problem like example climate change and fights food loss. Software is actually a tool for a better future, like a hammer is a tool for creating house that keep you warm and safe. And this, this is the meaningful, motivating and inspiring tech talk. And I'm happy to tell you uh, shortly what we have done to these stereotypes in Finland and share some awesome results of our actions. I worked at the Finnish Software and E-Business Association, and we represent over 600 software companies. Three years ago, we created this easily scalable model of cost-free, low threshold activities like workshops, webinars, and events offered to every adult woman. These different kinds of activities provide women an opportunity to learn in a peer group in a safe place. We asked it what they need, and then we provided it. We introduce women in tech from different backgrounds. We tell a different kind of career stories. We tell about the different positions in IT. We break these stereotypes that have ruined all the industry and software developer professions with the help of these women, software companies and schools, because we all have the same goal. We also created a community that supports the change and learning process every single day. And I'm so tired of hearing that women are not interested in tech. Because we are, we are. In our workshops, the waiting lines are huge, easily 200 people in a queue. Our record is 800 women in a workshop waiting list 
tech based coding based workshop waiting list. The demand is bigger than I can even provide. And, e and in our purely tech based events, there are always over a thousand women attending in a land size of the Finland. And they say that women are not interested in tech. Today's event is about harnessing technology and innovations to support women's post-pandemic economic empowerment. This is the title. And this happens in my experience, our program's experience. It happens by supporting women and letting them harness themselves for this cause. And all we needed to do was listen to these women, ask what they need, and then provide it. Let's talk more actions. Eihän se ole kuin tehdä, as I say in Finnish. Just do it. Every day in my work, I see this joy when these women learn something new. They find their true passion and they get better chances in life. Every time I receive a message from somebody who got a new job in the tech industry or companies let me know about the new hire, I cry happy tears because we women, we are doers and we are innovators. We are not just users. Thanks. Many thanks, uh, Milia Kopsi. I, <laughs> I really like this framing of you, you can be a princess and you can be a software programmer. It's all about reframing and, and counteracting uh, uh, very prevalent stereotypes still. Thank you very, very much. Uh, it's again my honor to introduce a colleague, uh, Professor Barbara Orser. Barbara Orser is a full professor at and the Deloitte Professor in the Management of Growth Enterprise at the Telfer School of Management at University of Ottawa. Her research, teaching, and advocacy focus on entrepreneurship and women's economic empowerment. Advisory and board roles include Women 20 Delegation Canada, Women's Economic Imperative, International Journal of Gender and Entrepreneurship, and Global's Women Entrepreneurship Policy Research Group. Dr. Barbara Orser conducts research about entrepreneurial feminism, small and medium-sized enterprise, growth, and public policy. She's also the co-author of bestseller Feminine Capital, Unlocking the Power of Women Entrepreneurs, published at Stanford University Press, and has led numerous large-scale studies about entreprise growth. Dr. Orser, what does the research actually tell us about ways that technology can be, uh, can leverage, can be the leverage to support market-driven education and training as well? Merci, Martin. Bonjour. Good day, everyone. I'm honored to participate on this panel of distinguished leaders at this sad and difficult time. One way to link the themes of today's discussion is by reference to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There are 193 signatory economies to the UN goals. These goals include quality education, gender equality, economic growth, and innovation. And these goals are particularly relevant to over 400 million women entrepreneurs around the world. Between the UN goals and women entrepreneurs are organizations that governments must work with and through. Banks, training organizations, industry, and advocacy groups. My perspective reflects a career researching and working with entrepreneurs and organizations that comprise their ecosystems. I'll begin by sharing highlights from four studies that illustrate this work and then summarize key lessons learned. My core message is that we must better understand the gender, racial, and cultural context of technology and education programs. And this is the role of research. My first example is the work of Telfer graduate student, Raula Peter. Rula is researching women entrepreneurs in rural Nigeria. Sub-Saharan Africa has pioneered technology-enabled money services to facilitate access to finance. 
And we knew at the outset that women retailers were less likely than men to both use formal lenders and digital wallets. Her interviews with women entrepreneurs document that time management is a key barrier for accessing capital and technology. These women did not have the energy or time to learn the tech and did not feel welcomed by financial institutions. They spoke with regret about the time wasted in attempts to participate in government training and other programs. Tolerance of low service standards has multiple impacts, discouraging these women, wasting their already limited time. Provision of technology, money, services, and programming were not sufficient. My second example relates to the work of the Global Women's Enterprise Policy Research Group. This is a group comprised of scholars from over 30 countries who are critically examining women's enterprise policies. And one project is in collaboration with the OECD. And yesterday, the OECD released our report, Entrepreneurship Policies Through a Gender Lens. I am one of three academic editors. And our report found that no entrepreneurship policy or program is gender neutral. Women's enterprise policies are often fragile, time limited, and small scale. Policies without programs and programs without commensurate funding or policy support. Women's enterprise policies are also vulnerable to changes in government and political priorities. Mandates for gender-based budgeting and intersectional analysis were almost universally absent. My third example illustrates positive outcomes of leadership and academic engagement. And this involved working with the Canadian Bureau of International Education on the LEAP program, Launching Economic Achievement Program for Women in Jordan. LEAP is a multi-year collaboration with INJAZ. And INJAZ is a leading nonprofit organization that has trained over a million Jordanians in entrepreneurship, life skills, and financial literacy. Funded by Global Affairs Canada, LEAP objectives are in part to improve the environment and culture for women entrepreneurs. Our work involved gender-based analysis of course syllabi, lecture materials, and workbooks. We held focus groups with students, women entrepreneurs, and in just staff and volunteers. These assessments led to a comprehensive redesign of training material to ensure content and delivery were inclusive. Train the trainer programs and the creation of a women-focused small business accelerator in a man. While at the outset, course content reflected men as entrepreneurs. Within 18 months, workbooks and other materials were revamped to incorporate women role models and content to counter stereotypes about women entrepreneurs. Inclusive entrepreneurship education, driving innovation, and commercializing technology. Motivated by this work, Telfer colleague Dr. Catherine Elliott and I have launched an assessment tool tailored for entrepreneurship educators, program managers, and funders. And why an assessment tool? Telfer studies indicate that many small business organizations seek to be more inclusive, yet staff have limited knowledge about how to modify courses, design, content, and delivery. Most diversity, equity, inclusion assessment tools are repurposed from large employer settings. To adapt and beta test this tool, we are working with partners in management schools in Nigeria, Kenya, Peru, and Mexico. This project is spearheaded by Women's Economic Imperative with funding from International Development Research Centre. Deploying online tools, teams are working to assess and then revamp entrepreneurship education across four countries. From these and other projects, I've observed common threads that work for and against achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. To close the gap between the UN goals and the experiences of women-identified entrepreneurs requires political will, 
overarching policy frameworks, such as Canada's feminist international assistance policy, and domestically, the entrepreneurship strategy and black entrepreneurship program, context specific interventions. While my remarks focus on entrepreneurship, lessons learned extend across all sectors and types of employment. We've learned that by itself, technology is not sufficient. Offering funding and training programs alone are not sufficient. Rather, all must inform each other and all must operate with a cleaner understanding and a clearer understanding of gender and cultural context. As we speak, it remains that most COVID recovery measures do not consider the gender regressive impacts of the pandemic. This final point was made over a year ago by UN Women, the World Bank and others. Governments have shown tremendous capacity to pivot quickly to procure COVID related goods and services. Similar momentum is now needed to advance measures that prioritize the economic well-being of women in the wake of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Orser. Once again, extremely interesting, fascinating, especially the, the, the part on the power of language, the words that we use and how we frame women in terms of technology usage. Um, I hope we have a little bit of time in about five minutes to uh, take questions from the audience and address some of these uh, themes. Uh, last but not least, we have asked actually four students participating in the University Global Citizenship Skills Development Programs called UO Global Program to actually read the UN Women Report and share their ideas about how to empower women. So I'm very pleased to introduce Rashidata Sidibe, Yasmin Okuk, Fanta Diaby, and Yasmin Bouzaboun, who have, part who have participated in this video. Adele, we have no sound. We have to reshare with uh, sound selected. Exactly. We, we're not. We're not hearing the. Um... Just check the share audio box when we reshare the screen. We can give it another try, or we can go to questions from the audience while we are. Um, addressing the technology issue. Sorry, may I ask uh, Sylvie to share her video? Yeah. Okay. Sylvie, are you here? Hello, my name is Rashida Tassizibe, the Ottawa student in the Master of Communication and co-founder of OZAN. Hello everyone, my name is Yasmin Okuk and I'm doing my master's in organizational communication at the University of Ottawa. Hi, my name is Sylvia Jabi. I'm a master graduate student in international and public affairs from Ottawa University. And my name is Yasmin Bouzaboun. I'm an Ottawa student in the master's of communication specialized in the theories of media. Uh, the first thought we had while discussing the report was how we didn't bring up the impact of the pandemic on artists. Because of health restrictions, museums and art galleries had to close around the world, depriving artists from their only income. What we propose for this case is the creation of a sales environment linking female artists around the world to potential buyers with the help of the government, museums and art galleries. The creation of this online platform could facilitate the selling process and help female artists through the pandemic. Concerning the topic of informal work that is widely spread across Africa and Asia, the problem is the lack of precise data that will enable politicians to come up with effective public policies. What we propose here is encouraging scholars to do more groundwork, to be able to get the most accurate and precise numbers on which population is most present in the informal work, what are the major problems they're facing. Being from African countries ourselves, we know that most women work in the black, and having access to aggregated data will be the first step towards helping with the informal work because it will give different politicians an insight into the problems and will help make the public policies more effective, which will be beneficial in the long run. 
One of our recommendations to answer the question of the position of women and young girls during the COVID pandemic is to create a solution directly linked to technology, which will meet the needs of women in the context of mental health. Indeed, we believe that the creation of a mobile application and the website are important tool uh, to allow women to express themselves vis-à-vis -vis the global pandemic and to receive psychological help. The purpose of this tool is to bring together women and professionals in the field of mental illness. It will be a listening cell, anonymous, where individuals can share emotions, fears, and all kinds of situations that have suffered, they have suffered um, and that affect their mental well-being. It may also have an emergency option to denounce any harassment and violent acts. The example of the mobile application and the website as tools for mental health is proof that the entrepreneurial spirit is of the greatest importance, especially during pandemic times. It is important to promote entrepreneurs. We recommend calling out to non-governmental organizations like OZAM, based in Ivory Coast, whose objective is to help women achieve their, goal, their plans and guide them throughout their entrepreneurial path. Also, initiatives like University of Ottawa's Startup Garage should spread throughout other universities to provide today's youth with the tools to develop their ideas. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing the perspective of students. Very, very interesting. We have now time for a few questions. Um, and there's a couple of them in the chat. And the first one is addressed, I believe so, to the four panelists today. It's a rather long question, but very interesting question. So here it is, some great comments, remarks so far. It is certainly important to encourage more women, girls into STEM, high tech based disciplines. However, in many discipline, women's entry to STEM discipline is not the problem. Rather, it is retaining them in STEM high-tech disciplines. The leaky pipeline is well established. Women in STEM high-tech are not typically staying in these sectors due to the embedded gender biases. So I'm interested to know what ideas today's speakers might have in relation to addressing the embedded gender biases that exist later on in the process when women, girls are graduating and taking up roles within these sectors. Wonderful questions. Addressing the cultural context, addressing the, the, the power of language, the power of stereotypes. So uh, uh, any, of the, any of the panelists that would like to address the question is welcome to do so. Barbara? Well, sure, as an educator, um, I, I think there are a couple of things. We have a lot of documentation around this issue. And we know that uh, women um, and young girls do not feel welcomed, uh, comfortable in the learning environments often. Um, so there's opportunity like we've done in entrepreneurship to look at the course content, the delivery, the culture to say what's going on here that we're losing students often after graduation in the sector. And we know that response strategies typically remain do it yourself, that it's downloaded to the individual with consequence to career, as opposed to institutionally looking at who are the key players in the ecosystem and what role do they have in affecting cultural change. Thank you, Dr. Orser. Not sure if other panelists would like to address these questions. Media raised her hand. Media, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, we resolved this problem in Finland that we involved the companies to our program. And in Finland, the companies are having a lot of these diversity and inclusive programs and we attend them, attend them. So we are helping them, them to understand the diversity and the inclusion and what kind of actions they should do. And they are actually pretty happy to do this because all these companies, they need new talents. They need new people. They need women who have a background on work life and other industries. So they are happy to work with us. And this is the way we are resolving this problem so we can get a women's stay at the industry. Thank you, um, Minya Kopsi. Another question actually for you regarding Mimit Koda. Do you know if there are similar initiatives in Canada for women interested in tech? 
Actually, I don't know about the Canada. I know that some countries have uh, some few few programs there here and there, and I'm happy to help and share my experience if needed. But sorry, no, I don't know about the Canada situation. But I'm happy to. Uh, okay. Take a I, I, I see that Barbara may want to add something on this question, Dr. Morrison. Mm -hmm. My go-to on this is women in communications and tech. They're the longest established uh, industry association supporting women in technology. And they also have some nice diagnostics and learning tools online for free that can be downloaded. So that's women communications and tech. Thank you, thank you. Um, I do have a question for Ambassador Erickson actually. Uh, Ambassador, so we've heard many, many things this morning again, is inspiring and thoughtful remarks. From your perspective, could you share your views about collaboration amongst international stakeholders, especially between government, academia, and civil society, in order to, to support economic empowerment of women in the world, the key messages that we want to bring back home today? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the collaboration between different stakeholders is key and, and the women's part participation in de decision making in all issues concerning uh, themselves uh, is a cornerstone to, to get uh, results. Uh, Minister Skinnery mentioned generation equality and that is a, a good example of, of bringing actors from all around the globe uh, and, and society together. Finland has worked together with different stakeholders in preparing the five-year blueprint. And we have learned a lot from each other. We all have different strengths and bring different experience and knowledge to the table. Now, when we are embarking on the implement implementation phase, the idea is to continue to its fruitful collaboration. I think the only way to make an impact, impactful change is by working together in all global questions, such as women's economic empowerment, because together we are stronger and, and we should not uh, overlook uh, half of the population of the world, which is the women. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks, Ambassador. I will now uh, turn to Adele for, because I'm conscious of time, we have a few minutes left, Adele, so I will be turning the floor to you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you for all our uh, panelists uh, and partners. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to ask uh, His Excellency Roy Erickson to say a few words of uh, conclusion, and I will come back later to uh, really close uh, the session. Uh, Mr. Erickson, uh, we would like to hear from you, please. Okay, thank you, Adele. First of all, I would like to thank the panelists for a very uh, interesting interventions. As we have heard, there is already a lot of information about how the pandemic has affected women. And now it's time to ensure that they will be part of a solution for a sustainable economic growth. If you can harness the potential of women in this growth, the sky is the limit in what we can achieve. Minister Gould told how Canada is promoting an environment enabling women's economic empowerment worldwide. Minister Skinnery pointed out what Finland is doing in the Generation Equality Action Coalition, and especially on the issue of how technology and innovation can be used for advancing the economic empowerment of women and girls. Executive uh, the Director uh, Nkuka uh, gave an insight of the analysis by UN Women she underlined what actions can be taken in the wake of the pandemic in order to enhance the economic situation of women. Ms. Kepsi, on the other hand, gave inspiring examples what has been done to encourage women and girls to enter the world of coding and technology. Professor also gave her insight from the academic world on women's empowerment. And lastly, the students came up with concrete new ideas to realize in order to help women. The common thread in all of these is the possibilities that can, can go on unnoticed and or underutilized if women are not part of the solution. We need the economic empowerment for women, not only for their sake, but also for the best of our society and economy as a whole. 
The pandemic caused the economies to shrink all over the globe, and it is time to think about how to get the economies back on track. In this, we need all hands on deck, and we should not forget the formidable force that lies in the empowerment of women. With these words, I conclude the event. I hope the webinar has given you all food for thought. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency. <clears throat> it's really appreciated. Uh, I'm sorry for the protocol breach I will make. I was told that uh, uh, Executive Director Mlan Bonguka raised her hand. Uh, sorry, we missed your raised hand. Would you like to say a few words? We still have two minutes. Madame Lambon Guka, we would well, really I, love, please. Yes. I just wanted to highlight a generation a equality as a mechanism to increase the use of technology, especially by girls, uh, because we intend in generation equality to have uh, the gender digital divide in the next five years. It gives us an opportunity to significantly increase the use of technology by girls. This is something we can do at schools, we, something we can do to teachers because the teachers are an important stakeholder in, the, in this architecture of uh, uh, innovation and, and, and technology. And I wanted to invite all of you, wherever you are, to participate in generation equality and enable uh, the advancement of technology for, for girls, uh, as well as for, for, for women in the countries that you are in. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Lambonguka. Again, I apologize. We missed your raised hand, but I thank uh, our colleague, Kaisa Hekila, who uh, alerted uh, us. And I'm really glad we heard from you because indeed it's a very good opportunity to participate in this, in this initiative and to read the reports uh, uh, published by UN Women. Uh, finally, I would like again, on behalf of the University of Ottawa and uh, my personal uh, capacity in name, to thank all the panelists, Minister Gould, Minister uh, Skinari, uh, direct, uh, Executive Director Mlambo Nguka, uh, Milia uh, Kopsi, thank you. I think we will learn a lot of you from you. We will invite you to the university one day. And also from my colleague Barbara and our four students. Many thanks to my colleague and friend, Martina Lagasse for your mo moderator role. I really appreciate that. And uh, a sincere thank you to all our collaborators. It was a teamwork at the Embassy, Global Affairs Canada, the University, UN Women, and the Foreign Affairs in Finland. Uh, I hope we will have other opportunities actually to work again together and to develop concrete uh, uh, actions in partnership between uh, different stakeholders at the university, at the government, NGOs, uh, civil society, and the business uh, industrial participation is very, very important. It's key, actually, if we're talking about economic development. I wish you all a very good day, very good evening. And I, was, I will say again, see you soon. Thank you to all attendees at the university. We have several activities, just follow us. And thank you to all the attendees, ministers, ambassadors I saw on the list and colleagues and friends of the University of Ottawa. Au revoir et à la prochaine.